So an interesting stat that Jim Hughes sent me, um, one of these insurance database studies, only about a year old, uh, in the community setting, only about 30 to 35 percent of biopsies have a pre-biopsy MRI. So it's still pretty low. Now, they went back in time, and like five, ten years ago, it was low 2 percent or something like that. So it's better, but inevitably, there's going to be some low-grade uh, biopsies uh, happening. Crawford used to be at this meeting and like to say almost every year that, you know, our goal is to prevent active surveillance, which is a great thing to aspire to, but we know that the the byproduct of all these efforts is there's going to be some grade group one. So we'll get to the conclusions of what to do about it. What I wanted to do is a bit of a scoping review, tackle a few recent papers to just sort of demonstrate what are the re remaining images or remaining thoughts out there in gro low grade and then see what we should be doing moving forward. If you look at the PROTECT study, of course we saw fairly equivalent prostate cancer specific survival, METS free survival even though there was quite a bit of treatment that inevitably occurred in the active monitoring um, trial. So I put together kind of a few summary comments. We know that, so similar 15-year survival with three randomized cohorts, of which most of that, a little over 70%, was grade group one and two. Now we know that that was kind of old school grade group one, mostly MRI, uh, non-MRI based biopsy, and the ones randomized to surgery had a fairly high 30-something percent upgrade rate. And surveillance was done on clinical judgment more than a formal protocol with time biopsies or imaging. But even with that circumstance, you might conclude that the overall concept is there was not a whole lot of survival outcome penalty for people randomized to surveillance, even if they later were treated in terms of the timing of that. So we'll try to keep that in mind. So one question was, what are the mortality rates from grade group one? I could show you some surgical path features where it's practically zero, as long as people are agreeing on what grade group one should look like. But biopsy studies are different. So for example, this study uh, from a Danish registry study, um, only, you know, just 2024 public publication, um, if you go through their um, flow chart, uh, you know, in a registry of 190,000 diagnosed people, when you work your way through all the uh, exclusions, they still end up with over 12,000 men who had grade group one diagnosed. And uh, some of the key figures on the Kaplan-Meier curves, the C, which is the top left one, you have the two curves, that's active surveillance. So the dotted higher line is uh, all-cause mortality, which you expect to have some of that over time. And then the bottom curves are uh, prostate cancer-specific mortality. Now, if you look at the end of the curve at 15 years, you're still below 10%, but it's not zero, right? So there's, there's a little bit of chaos in there, so to speak. The D, which is high right, that's the, just the incidence of treatment of men entering uh, surveillance for grade group one. And then the bottom one is they actually differentiated watchful waiting, likely due to age. You can see both curves shift up a little bit as opposed to more of an active uh, treatment on people who would be curative candidates. Um, this is from Daria Tilke and the uh, Martini group in Germany. Again, they looked at Remember, you can mix and match grade group one with low risk. Remember, it's not all the same. So they looked at grade group one, then stratified by PSA. They actually had quite a bit of patients. The low two bars on the left curve is prostate cancer specific mortality, with the lower curves uh, being your sort of more typical PSA under 20 uh, broken out. The higher bar is PSA over 20 with grade group one, which does occur. Uh, and so that's looking at prostate cancer specific mortality and on the right, all cause uh, mortality. Um, so there are, you know, that, those would probably be your target rich environments to, to look further than just the biopsy alone. Now, should we use genomic classifiers? There's a lot of examples out there. I decided just for time to just uh, focus on um, Decipher. And you can derive a lot of statements on this space from guidelines, various industry sponsored research, uh, clinical practice, and, and even with patient driven. Uh, requests are. So on this uh, multi-group study from 2022, they looked at uh, multivariable logistic regression analysis of factors associated with biopsy upgrading during active surveillance. So in a multivariable, some of the standard ones like Pirates 5 were actually neutral. It was really decipher score per 0.1 unit and having three or more positive cores that had the highest um, correlation. You'll see different conclusions on different setups and they had sort of a prediction curve that looked at clinical variables with or without 
decipher. So that's one way to go. I don't really get a lot of deciphers on grade one, group ones, but sometimes it's already been done and they, when they come in and so then you have to occasionally try to explain what does a high risk decipher score mean when you have one core Gleason 6 and in some cases a negative MRI. That's a bit of a head scratcher. Maybe that's potential. Um, but I like this one too. This is another uh, decipher score where they looked at the effect of age over time by grade grouping. So I'm just going to blow up the graph there because what you're looking at specifically here is grade group one and the red bar is the percent of people study that had high risk genomic scores. So it's around 10% for men under 60 and then it kind of slowly merges to 22% when you get over 80. Of course the survival curves of those are going to be different because you're okay so your younger man will have less aggressive genomics but will have a whole lot more survival time you know, an 80-year-old might have more aggressive disease. We sort of see that in um, patterns of Gleason scoring anyway, but potentially shorter overall survival time. But there is some genomic high score in low grade. The question is what to do about it, really. So then the next topic to just highlight would be, what about grade group one that does come off of targeted biopsies, especially pyreds four and five? Um, and that could, you know, versus PyRADS 3 where it's MR invisible or, you know, then there's different papers that looked at software versus cognitive biopsy, the whole trust TP template. Um, so in this paper, looking at grade group 1 and PyRADS 5 uh, type combinations, on the left would be the maximum PyRADS from biopsies already done that were Gleason 6 and so you see uh, around 12% were PyRADS 5 with Gleason 6. And on the right is among people who um, had just, just look at the Gleason scoring by PyRADS, so you have to go, well really if you look at the top three colors, that's your grade group five, four, and three. You can see already the top three bars, that's half your patients have, you know, somewhat of a positive MRI despite uh, a grade group one. At the bottom then you see around 15% uh, grade group one with PyRADS five. Um, so then this is their upgrade free survival on, um, active surveillance somewhat parallels what Protect showed were well, actually a little more, a little over 50 percent were, well, because there's a difference between treatment and upgrading. You can uh, graph those out separately. So to be clear, that was with PyRADS 5, so a little over half the patients were upgraded at some point. So now does, again, another version of does visibility of grade group 1 impact uh, long term? They have another multivariable analyses in the table this time. PSA density was significant, positive cores was significant, uh, even the year of the multiparametric MRI, maybe we're getting better at the reads over time. Um, then we'll go through uh, three of their curves. You, know, you can see that the red curve is the more clearly positive MRI that clearly distinguishes itself. This one is on definitive treatment-free survival. You can see over half the patients with a, a Pyrex 5 are getting treated. Um, this one is upgrade-free and on the right is unfavorable RP pathology with PyRADS5. That kind of reinforces the concept of the MRI being a biomarker in and of itself, as we've shown in different ways. And then what about the overall progression rate for active surveillance grade group one? Um, uh, so this was the Italian group looking at the effects of family history uh, from a large single institution study, just blowing up that key curve. And I realized when I was looking at my slides one more time, I'd forgotten what they meant by family history unfavorable versus the others. But clearly family history, maybe the relative and unfavorable disease had um, quite a bit of um, uh, reclassification over half the patients even by year five. So family history might be a predictor to throw in there. And this is uh, one of the older Johns Hopkins paper that just sort of flow charted their active surveillance uh, fairly nicely. They had a fairly low incidence of um, prostate cancer specific mortality nearly flatlined zero and then all cause mortality mainly picking up at 10 to 15 years. But these are the curative interventions again at 10 years roughly half the patients had an intervention and then separately looking at upgrading by one versus two uh, levels so to speak. Now I don't want to turn this into a soapbox debate but it, you almost have to at this point over the is this true or not? <laughs> um, so let me just take you through what you might say in the clinic. If grade group one is a cancer, you might say to the patient as sort of an opening statement, you have prostate cancer, but it is low grade. 
with no true mortality other than diagnostic undersampling or change over time. We recommend surveillance with scheduled follow-up PSA, MRI, and biopsy. We will discuss other features that might increase risk of progression to needing curative treatment. Now, if you're saying grade group one is not a cancer, you can't say it's normal. You have to say something, so you have something to the effect of, you do not have prostate cancer, however, you do not have a normal biopsy either, or you could make that into a double negative somehow. Um, you have a finding that we used to call cancer that has no true, and then the rest of the statement, it's identical, <laughs> which is kind of my point. Um, so it's, I, I get that people are trying to reduce over-treatment of disease. I have yet to find a pathologist, and we have two at the meeting, right? Yeah, I've yet to meet a pathologist personally that agrees with it not being a cancer, because it's histologic cancer. It would be a cancer in any other location. It meets criteria. The management is on clinicians. And I sort of have a conspiracy theory idea that if there are people out there that overtreat low grade one, they're going to figure out a way to overtreat whatever we call the revised grade group one. That's just my theory <laughs> until you prove me otherwise. You could go on, and I've seen whole you know, plenary sessions on this. It's a great debate. Um, now, I, one paper, another Hopkins paper, we, it, uh, Christian brought it up as well. We, all, we do referee pathology. I really can't find a published referee pathology that was new. And I, maybe that needs to be done, because I do wonder if it's different. This is a 2010 Epstein paper, Hopkins. So Gleason 6 original referee, 93% concordance. Gleason 7 at 75%, with a little bit on both sides. Gleason 8 to 10, 63% concordance, with obviously the chance of going down one or two levels. We, um, theoretically, we have an old policy at Anderson that they have to have referee pathology, although we don't really enforce it anymore. You need to have evidence of cancer, but go to the OR. I hate to delay surgery if we can't get an outside lab to mail in the slides. But anyway, it is an opportunity. So let me just finish with some discussion points, because what ends up happening in the clinic is, top left bullet, they have grade group one, but from an outside biopsy, and there's no imaging. <laughs> so what do I do? I usually wait three months at least, you, maybe longer. I mean, the idea if you hear from imaging experts is, yes, you can do an MRI six weeks after a biopsy, but the images might be cleaner if you kind of, and it's grade group one, so why not just wait a little bit? If they have a target, I would do sort of an immediate fusion confirmatory. If there's not a target, I'd just go by the Canary trial findings and do a confirmatory in a year. I do all mine transperineal. Now, if they have grade group one biopsy in or out with targets, maybe you accept that and just sort of get them into our protocol. If it's a Pyrex 5, though, that's when I start getting interested in doing at least one biopsy myself and or work in genomics if you think that would help. Um, then the other considerations that I thought it was quickly nicely put in the abstract from Andrew L's group, unusually high PSAs, known genomic markers, high risk, and then possibly even throw in family history as ways to treat it differently. Occasionally, there are benign reasons why people want treatment, 150 gram prostate, low grade retention. Sometimes it is cleaner just to do that all at once rather than segregate that into some missed procedure and then still have to follow, but you know, there's some options there. And then just some comments on MD Anderson workflows. I, we show a much higher yield whether or not we do a straight TP template with the anterior sampling or at least one fusion versus trust. So we at least like one of those somewhere in the workup. Um, and all these algorithms that you saw off the trials, the, the benefit of getting all that mapped out over time is it, especially in a referral uh, clinic, this is a whole lot easier to do if advanced practice providers can learn it and really help with some of the ordinary visits where they just need a PSA and they need their MRI charted out. But they, APPs, most of them, they want everything charted out. They like an algorithm. They can't be a guess what I'm thinking game about when you want the intervals of all that to be done. So we still do second opinion path. We try to merge MRI to our center for consistency. Um, we use our screening, uh, you know, genetic counseling if that's indicated. And I would say minimal use of genomic markers other than unusual situations or it's already been, been done. So that's the diagnostic part, but I think the fascinating part of it is that when I go back to PROTECT trial, I, I think it's still reasonable to maximize diagnostics and make a plan. I don't really think any of it has to trigger essentially a prophylactic treatment or, or you know, surgery or radiation. Gray group two is different, and that's a whole separate talk, so that's why I just wanted to talk about gray group one. So I think we need to 
optimize the diagnostics. I'm still probably going to wait on something definitive to change, even in those higher risk groups. But anyway, we'll stop there. Thanks.